Dean, if you're here, please unmute yourself and uh, share your, your slides. I'm here. Okay. Let's see, my, let's see if I can then. Um, hey, how do I share screen? Uh, bottom center. Share screen. There we go. Um, I guess this one here. Share. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, looks good. All right. So, um, yeah, so I'll just jump into it. Uh, so, uh, yeah, we're going to talk about some of the studies we've done with um, uh, trying to circumvent uh, product inhibition. And my plan is to talk a little bit about why we're doing it, how we're doing it, and what we obtain. And then I'll hopefully be able to say a few words about what it all means. And I would like to uh, uh, propose that those of you who are interested in these kind of issues that you also uh, tune in to Didlew's presentation, where he's using AI-based uh, design of experiments techniques to actually do optimizations uh, in, in, a, in a closed loop. It's a really beautiful work that uh, Didlew has been getting. He's one of my students. But okay, let's jump into it. Why are we doing this? Well, some of you may remember that I have for, you know, I don't know, 20 years <laughs> been working on making um, a, a protocell. And uh, the big issue is to get uh, information to replicate at a high enough yield. And um, our protocell is a very simple, it has a very simple design. We have a container, we have on the surface of the container, uh, information attached, and at the surface of the container, we also have a metabolically active molecule. And um, we've written extensively, published ex extensively uh, about how this works. And, and the, the big uh, bottleneck for us has been, you know, the last actually uh, five, six years, has been to actually implement a, an information replication system that is efficient enough. So for those of you who are interested in, in, in seeing our background there, you can just Google and uh, Google my name and, and uh, all our papers. And yeah, well, uh, we have uh, at the center of, of our approach, we have this metabolic system that um, uh, is light driven. And with this light driven uh, ruthenium complex that is attached to the, uh, to the surface, we are able to, we have published and shown that we can get the vesicles to grow and divide. We have shown that we can, um, using the same chemistry, um, use a oxyguanine, uh, that means a, an information molecule uh, element uh, driven or controlled uh, metabolism. Um, and uh, we can also, we have also shown we can do ligation, we can do a photo, a photo driven ligation. And these are kind of, this is, a, uh, um, some of this is 10, more than 10 years old, these results here. So, so, but we've been stuck experimentally to, to, uh, to get any further. And, and what, why has it been so difficult? And I think that, um, there's, the, the community has for many years tried to figure out how you can uh, replicate XNA, RNA, PNA, R, uh, you know, uh, DNA, whatever your favorite uh, XNA is. And I think it's fair to say that it's still an open question how to implement a sort of a non-insomatic base by base um, XNA replication. And I can say that because I, I know some of the very best chemists uh, for several generations has tried to do that and, and this has not yet uh, been possible. So um, it's much, much easier to do something else, namely to take small pieces of oligomer and ligate them because you can do that with, uh, without uh, sophisticated enzy enzymes. Uh, but the problem by doing that is that um, uh, you, you tend to get product inhibition, and I'll show you what that means if you don't already know. Um, and there is a, a, a long history where people uh, discuss these things. I think Günter von Kodrowski was the first, at least I'm aware of, that, that, uh, that um, uh, documented that. Um, Joyce has circumvented uh, product inhibition with, uh, with, with RNA replication where he's using stem loops of, I mean, much longer uh, molecules. Uh, the DNAs that Kondrovsky was using were just hexamers. There's six uh, bases. 
Yuderi and others have made um, uh, replication molecules based on, on ligation, but, but they're using peptides. And um, I think Stadler, uh, Peter Stadler, he sort of nailed the theory with all conceivable um, details uh, in, in, in the first uh, years of, of the zeros here. So, so how do we get um, away from this? How do we solve that? And, and I should may, maybe say one, say one more thing. For us to have a replication to happen at the surface of a, uh, of, of a vesicle or a droplet, we need to anchor our, uh, our DNAs. And this is what you've seen here. And we have published extensively about that. Um, and also there is a, um, a piece in, in, in the proceedings here about that. Um, we've also done uh, experimental work. Uh, the upper part is where we've demonstrated how we can uh, anchor things on the surface of vesicles. And the lower part is actually where we have ligation. This is uh, uh, Masayuki Yami that we're working with. It's not published yet. Um, so, so there is work, uh, experimental work in, in, in play, uh, trying to actually at attach these uh, uh, DNA strands uh, by, by using um, what's it called, conjugated uh, DNAs. But the big break, uh, as far as I can tell, was when Juliana Gibbs Davis group came up with a beautiful way to circumvent um, uh, product inhibition. They said, guys, uh, you've been looking at this wrong. What you need to do is to use, um, to use uh, 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 you know, mismatches and A bases. You simply have to make sure that uh, the, the DNA with um, uh, the, the, the what's it called the ligated DNA has an easy way of jumping off the template. And they here is here are some of the results from from uh, 2015. She's uh, uh, she has a patent for this method, and and she can use that to to actually as a, as a an alternative as an alternative for uh, for PCR amplification of DNA. So Lida. This is something you should remember. So we got encouraged by that, and we then sat down to investigate that in simulation. Here you have the system. Uh, I don't have time to go through all these details. Um, we have a, um, a, a paper in the proceedings, and then we have a much more extensive uh, uh, paper on the way where we go into many more details. Uh, but what is it that this essence of how we do this uh, investigation? Well, uh, with one of my students, uh, Jan Engelhardt, um, we figured out that if we focus on the free energy associated with um, uh, hybridization, then we can do something uh, quite interesting. And this idea, of course, we got from, from Gibbs Davis's work. So let's uh, assume that we <clears throat> we have we know the free energy of the of the hybridization of the two temp of the template, and we know the hybridization energies of the two oligomers. You can see that on, on top of the slide up here. And then we define um, this uh, difference in the free energy between the template uh, uh, hybridization and the two other oligomer uh, hybridizations, and then we use a well-known um, relationship we have between the free energy and uh, the um, uh, equilibrium constant where this is the on rate and this is the off rate of these things and with this in your bag you can actually uh, do some interesting things so it's quite simple so what we do then we go into the literature we go in and look at Santa Lucia and Hicks um, they seem to be this, the main reference or the one that we like the most and then we simply investigate uh, how we can build these oligomers and the template so that we get uh, the fastest possible kinetics. Again, remember the relationship between um, uh, the free energies of the, of, of the hybridization and the, um, and the on and off kinetics is given here. And we know from other studies, uh, one of my colleagues here at the University of Southern Denmark, they have done uh, studies where they've found out that small oligomers, the on rate is about uh, two to the seven small per second. So we assume, and it doesn't really matter much uh, about the details, they are pretty fast in, in finding each other. So we go in, we use uh, data from the literature to investigate how uh, this relationship here, uh, this gamma relationship, how that uh, results in different um, kinetics. 
first of course we have to see whether we can uh, we are in the woods or whether things are okay in the beginning we were in the woods until we realized that uh, we had forgotten to to adjust for temperature and once we adjusted for temperatures again when you i don't understand why uh, the uh, molecular biologists, well, I sort of understand, but I think it's a little weird that they all, they give the free energies and the entropies and the enthalpies for, for 37 centigrades instead of, you know, the experimental uh, conditions they're using uh, in the lab. Well, you know, we, we, our, t our body is, is uh, 37, so I guess that's why. Well, it is why. But this is an example of how, um, uh, you know, we can actually, by putting in the same um, uh, conditions at Gibbs Davis, we, we, we can hit the, uh, we can hit the, there, we can reproduce the experimental results quite well. So what happens once we look at the different relationships uh, between the, these delta, um, uh, for delta G for, for the first oligomer and, and delta G for the second oligomer? And one of the interesting things is that, um, uh, well, I, I should I don't know how much time I have, but I, Josh, how, how I can't see my three, watch. three minutes. Okay, so I don't have time anyway. So this, so this, this is uh, these are curves where we investigate how uh, the relative size of these two um, oligomers, the free energy, um, how how that impacts the uh, time evolution. I mean, how fast you can run your your replication kinetics. And the conclusion is that you get curves when you get the when you look at the envelope curve here, you get that you need to have the free energy of um, uh, these two oligomers to be the same. It has to be the same. That's when you have the fastest replication, and you can go down to replication times that are almost uh, uh, they're down around uh, ten minutes which is uh, more than uh, twice as fast as, as what has experimentally been done. And you can also study what the impact of ligation rate is. Here we go out, uh, the realistic ligation rates are in, in this range. I mean, we just did it for theoretical uh, reasons. So what does that mean? Well, number one, I really believe that if we want to understand the origins of life, if we want to make uh, simple uh, protocells that are not using um, modern molecules, we should focus on ligation-based XNA replication, not base-by-base -base replication. Second, um, by using um, this LIDA or LIXA, depending on what kind of, of XNA that's your favorite one, we can actually circumvent that. And the main thing we found was that uh, we need to make sure that the, um, that the free energy of the two templates is comparable or as close to the free energy of light like, of, uh, of hybridization of the two uh, oligomers and um, that means and and, and further we found that by making this bulge more profound than than uh, the experimental uh, results we should be able to have significantly higher rates yeah then we have some analytical expressions that i didn't have time to discuss but thank you i think that's it Thank you so much, Steen. Um, we have time for one question. So um, Juan, if you're here, did you want to unmute your microphone and ask your question? I am. I am here. Hello, Steen. It's good to hey. see you. <laughs> good morning, everybody. I have a double question, and I'll read it as I typed it in case uh, I didn't get a chance to read it myself. So question part one is, have you measured the heat flow during the ligation you perform? And two, what's the role of the ruthenium tris vpy that you use? Uh, no, I've not, I've not, uh, I've, number one, I've not measured, we've not measured uh, any heat flow. I mean, th these are under, uh, under constant uh, temperature conditions. I don't think there is any uh, significant heat uh, release or, or th these are very minute, at least in the concentration we have. Secondly, um, the ruthenium here is, um, let me just show, can you see this? Am I still sharing? Yeah, yep, we can yep. see it. Yep. Okay, no, may, may, maybe we should, uh, maybe this one, this is too complicated. Maybe this one is better. Um, oh yeah, I yeah, guess. So, so here, here we have, the ruthenium is, is a metabolic molecule. We, we, are, we, are take, we are using light and this ruthenium complex 
convert uh, photo energy into chemical energy, and then we can build, we can make the uh, container building blocks. These are uh, the canola acid in what our situation, and we can make the oligomers. Well, we can make the oligomers uh, work by uh, operational by making um, photofragmentation. So it's it's a very simple um, digestive system we have. But the short answer, the ruthenium complex is our metabolic complex. It's just one molecule and it's very simple. I understand very well. Thank you. Okay, thanks for, thanks for the question. Yeah, thank you both. Um, our next speaker is uh, Karsten Hahn. Uh, 